Hi everyone. In today's video, we will talk about hedge funds, an exciting and fascinating topic, provided that hedge funds are in the business of making money out of thin air, figuratively speaking. Before we start, we will make some clarifications regarding the common legal and fee structures of alternative investments. Both hedge and private equity funds are usually set up and run as limited partnerships, or LP. This type of legal structure includes general partners, or GPs, and limited partners, LPs. GPs are responsible for managing a given investment fund. They have unlimited liability. LPs, on the other hand, are the investors in the fund. They have limited liability and a profit share proportionate to their investment. Limited partnerships are usually based on tax-efficient locations. They aren't subject to strict regulations, as they are not typically offered to the general public. Instead, LPs are restricted to qualified investors, such as institutions and high-net-worth individuals. These investors are generally expected to be more knowledgeable and able to take higher risks. The common fee structure of alternative investment funds includes a management or base fee and an incentive or performance fee. The management fee is calculated annually on assets under management, or AUM. The incentive fee, also known as a hurdle rate, is usually calculated on profits above a certain level of return. Another widely used feature is the so-called high watermark. This is the highest net asset value, or NAV, that a fund has reached and for which a performance fee is paid. Setting a high watermark protects investors from paying fees on downside outperformance. It also ensures that they won't pay twice for the same increase in net asset value, or NAV. In other words, when high watermarks are in place, fund managers must recover any losses before charging a performance fee on newly generated profits. That said, we can now start examining hedge funds in more detail. In trying to beat the market, these investment vehicles deploy a variety of strategies, such as the use of leverage, derivatives, and taking short positions. Hedge fund performance is measured either in terms of an absolute return, for example, 15%, or on a relative basis versus a benchmark index. For example, 10% above S&P 500. Redemption turns include a lockup period, during which investors cannot withdraw the money they have put in a given hedge fund. The notice period is also part of the redemption terms. It usually lasts between one and three months. This restriction is posed for a reason. It often happens that hedge fund managers need to exit illiquid positions and convert holdings into cash. The notice period gives them time to do that in an orderly manner. Hedge funds may have redemption fees intended to offset any transaction costs incurred in this process. Okay, before moving on, it is worth mentioning the so-called funds of hedge funds. They provide access to a diversified portfolio of hedge funds and allow smaller investors to participate. Great, now let's take a look at some of the typical hedge fund strategies. More precisely, we'll discuss four main categories of hedge funds. These are the event-driven, relative value, global macro, and equity hedge funds. Event-driven strategies are based on various corporate actions such as mergers, acquisitions, or restructuring. They entail taking long or short positions in equity or debt securities of the companies involved. Here, we have a couple of subcategories. Merger arbitrage involves buying the shares of an acquisition target company and selling short the shares of the buyer. This strategy is expected to profit from the spread between prices of the respective shares or from potential overpayment by the acquirer. The main risk involved here is that the deal may not close. Distressed or restructuring strategies involve investing in companies in financial distress, or in other words, firms that are about to file or have already filed for bankruptcy. In such cases, fund managers may choose to take a long or short position in the debt or equity securities of the distressed company. When taking a long position, they bid on a successful restructuring. Thus, they buy the company's securities at a discount and expect to profit from a price recovery. On the other hand, a short position is expected to be profitable in case of an unsuccessful restructuring. When going short, fund managers usually pick securities with lower investor protection, such as junior debt or common stock. These two approaches can also be combined by simultaneously taking a long position in senior debt and a short position in junior debt or equity. 
In this case, the hedge fund manager expects to profit from an increase in the price spread between the two classes of securities. Activist investing is another strategy based on triggering corporate actions. Activist hedge funds buy a sufficiently large shareholding in a company with the intention to influence its management. They would require the implementation of various corporate actions and strategies to increase the company's value. These may include divestitures, restructuring, capital distribution, or changes in management. Activist investing resembles the approach of private equity funds in trying to gain control over a company. However, the key difference here is that activist investors focus on public companies. Lastly, special situations funds invest in companies that are undergoing some sort of restructuring other than mergers, acquisitions, and bankruptcy. These include spin-offs, asset sales, and share buybacks. Okay, great. As we've seen, event-driven strategies can be quite interesting. Now, let's consider the relative value strategies. They focus on taking long and short positions in related securities and profiting from a temporary discrepancy in their perceived price relationship. Again, we have several subcategories here. The first one is called Fixed Income Convertible Arbitrage. It exploits any mispricing of convertible bonds. This strategy involves taking a long position in a convertible bond and a short position in the common stock of the same company. Asset-backed fixed income is another relative value strategy. It uses opportunities that arise from mispriced asset-backed securities, or ABS, and mortgage-backed securities, or MBS. General fixed income strategies exploit various pricing discrepancies within fixed income markets. These may include relative value positions between two different companies or between various securities of the same company. We also have volatility strategies. They typically use various derivative financial instruments to go long or short on market volatility in a single asset class or across different classes. Multi-strategy funds, as the term suggests, deploy various existing strategies to use relative value opportunities across asset classes. Great! We're moving on to the third category of strategies used. Macro hedge funds. Rather than analyzing specific companies, they look for opportunities arising from global economic and political events. Macro hedge funds bet on global market trends by taking long or short positions across equities, derivatives, fixed income, currencies, and commodities. And finally, we have equity hedge fund strategies that involve taking long and short positions in public equities and related derivatives. They differ from the event-driven or macro strategies by using a bottom-up rather than a top-down approach. Here are the most common variations of the equity hedge fund strategies. Market-neutral strategies focus on selecting undervalued securities to buy and overvalued ones to sell short. Hedge fund managers do that by using quantitative, technical, or fundamental analysis. The overall goal is to keep a net neutral market position and profit from individual securities movements. Next, we have the fundamental growth strategies. They use fundamental analysis to identify and take long positions in companies with high growth potential. On the other hand, fundamental value strategies take long positions in various undervalued companies, including non-high growth firms. Quantitative directional strategies use technical analysis to select undervalued stocks to buy and overvalued ones to sell short. Net market exposure may vary depending on the relative size of long and short positions taken. Short bias strategies, as the term suggests, take predominantly short market exposure in companies that are considered as overvalued. And finally, sector-specific strategies focus on a specific sector of expertise and use quantitative and fundamental analysis to identify different investment opportunities. A lot of strategies, right? In practice, many hedge funds begin by employing only one of them. Over time, they develop additional expertise and expand to become multi-strategy funds. Well done! Our next task is to examine the potential benefits and risks of hedge funds. The benefits are most visible in down equity markets, where hedge funds typically perform better than global equity markets. Long-term correlation with equities can also provide diversification benefits. Of course, these benefits vary according to the specific hedge fund strategy. 
because of the great variety of hedge fund strategies and the tendency for correlations to increase during periods of market turmoil, we should be careful when generalizing about the diversification benefits of hedge funds. Moreover, doing due diligence on hedge funds can be quite challenging. Overall, these investment vehicles have light regulatory disclosure requirements, and this potentially makes them less transparent. To sum up, when assessing hedge funds, we need to focus on the following questions. What are the strategy and investment processes they use? What are their historical returns, longevity, amount of assets under management, valuation, and returns calculation methods? What are their management styles, key person risks, and risk management systems? And what are their sources of competitive advantage, reputation, and growth plans? Some of these factors are difficult to quantify. Even the ones that seem more straightforward, like returns, for example, can present challenges to investors. For instance, strategies that have been successful in the past may decrease in effectiveness as more funds begin to use them. Okay, great! This is the end of today's video. If you are into educational investment and finance videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the like button. Thanks so much for sticking till the end. I'll see you in our next episode.